This conference will now be recorded. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our presentation on incorporating intermittent pneumatic compression therapy into your lymphedema and wound care practice. My name is Jennifer Wang. Um, if you can turn to the next slide, Dr. Evers, that'll be wonderful. Uh, the president of Paradigm Medical, we are a national medical products distributor specializing in lymphedema, post-mastectomy, and orthopedic footwear and foot care products. Most notably, you will know us for our line of intermittent pneumatic compression pumps, where we are the exclusive Canadian distributor of biocompression systems, lymphedema footwear, and um, a line of compression bras and mastectomy products. We are a Canadian owned and operated company and have been servicing Canada for over 30 years. I am so honored to be introducing Dr. Alvarez, our speaker today, who is joining us from New Jersey. Dr. Alvarez is the program director um, at the Vascular and Wound Care Center and an adjunct professor in the Department of Surgery at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Over the last 40 years, Dr. Alvarez has been a pioneering force in wound care and lymphedema. You know, over he is had so much experience um, with uh, the uh, IPC pumps. He's used them on um, you know around 400 to 600 patients, so he has a lot of experience. Um, and I think he would be excellent um, if you have any questions to um, address with him. He is the founding editor of the uh, journal Wounds. He's authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications related to wound care. Uh, he's been the principal investigator in more than 60 major clinical trials and is the recipient of the 21st annual John Boswick Award for Lifelong Achievement and Dedication in the Field of Wound Care. So, wow. I would personally like to thank Dr. Alvarez for his time and energy here today. We are in for a very special presentation. Um, today's presentation is in directly informed by questions from our community. Our aim is to address most of them and encourage your input throughout. Um, your questions are vital to providing optimal patient care. So please don't be afraid to ask. Your questions might help someone else too. Um, we are going to save all questions to the end. Um, there's a little chat box um, where you can type in your questions, uh, so please use that. It looks like a little bit of a dialogue image. I will be moderating the questions, so I'll be sure to make sure we get to all of them. Um, so thank you everyone for your time here today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Alvarez. For all of you who just joined us, please mute your devices uh, to try and minimize any background noises. And with that, I, I pass it to you, Dr. Alvarez. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to speak to you. And um, uh, please, uh, there are no questions that are not excellent. And uh, they're all very important, even if you have very little or no experience with compression devices and even compression therapy, period. Um, it's extremely important. Uh, before I begin, I just want to mention to you that I've had a ton of experience with lymphedema patients and lipedema patients, as well as patients with wounds. And I can tell you that they are very special people. And when you really succeed in what you do, as a therapist, I'm sure you know, as a physician, you know, and as a nurse, you certainly know, um, when you, these patients feel better and when they feel better, they start getting themselves fixed up. These women start wearing the makeup and the men start cleaning up and looking better. And it's just such a wonderful thing to have in your life to be able to see your improvement, your efforts. And you can see this with lymphedema. It's a wonderful, wonderful field to get involved in because there is a solution. First, we're going to speak about the diagnosis of lymphedema. Lymphedema is, a, is really obstruction of the lymph flow. Uh, this obstruction causes an expansion of the lymphatic space. And you can get up to about 60 or 70% of tissue volume. In the early stages, in the left slide histologically, uh, you get very little or intermediate fibrosis. Uh, fluid accumulates predominantly in the lymphatics. 
in the advanced stages, more fibrosis develops and there's a thickened fascia under the skin, deep underneath the skin in the interstitial space uh, of the skin. And it forms little lakes or little bitty lakes along the way where the lymph gets obstructed and held up. Uh, these artificial spaces get filled with collagen and as fibrosis develops, lymphedema gets much worse. It's a chronic disease marked by the collection of lymphatic fluid, but that's not really the only issue because it's the whole progress of the disease and the uncontrolled edema that leads to chronic inflammation. The fibrosis, which is very hard to treat, uh, once your patients get fibrosis and significant fibrosis, MLP therapy is less significant. Compression is less significant and anything you do conservatively is less significant. There are also manifestations, which you see below. Uh, these patients are prone to rashes, like stasis dermatitis, and they're also prone to hemosiderosis or staining of the yes. lymph. The chronic progressive accumulation of lymph in these spaces exceeds the capacity of the transport. And that's what's important about moving this fluid along the way. So it can be done with a minimal um, manual lymphatic therapy. Uh, obviously preferred is the complex decongestive therapy, uh, especially better when combined with intermittent pneumatic compression. Primary lymphedema is inherited. It's a congenital condition that uh, really is found at, at birth, uh, recognized within two years of birth. Uh, there's also lymphedema precox, uh, which occurs around puberty, or around the third decade of life. And then there's lymphedema tarda, which begins after 35 years of age. I can tell you that lymph lymphedema precox and lymphedema tarda are difficult to diagnose by the primary doctor, because unless there's a real clear history, these two are not diagnosed until the patient is quite advanced. There are stages of uh, lymphedema that, that are very important to note. Uh, at the latency stage, you really see no real, no real symptoms, no real physical evidence. Um, there's a subclinical state, um, but not really much goes on there uh, early on. In the mild stages, you can still elevate your leg and get um, improvement. Uh, and it's, it's really, this is the stage where the treatment is best. And you begin your treatment at the mild stage. You really see benefits much quicker and faster. And the patients are much more uh, happy and, and comfortable. Um, most patients don't get to the doctors until the moderate stage is developed. And um, here uh, you, you have pitting edema where you actually have an interstitial deep edema that causes spinning of the skin. Uh, and you'll begin to see some hardening of the tissues of so some fibrosis uh, on the lower leg uh, or interior thigh. Once you get to stage three, obviously this is the most difficult stage to manage, but probably by your therapy standards, this is some, a lot of times when you get your patients and you see that uh, improvement isn't fast. It takes a while, but it can be achieved. Secondary lymphedema uh, is not congenital, results from insult. Insult or injury, or um, obviously the most uh, uh, the second leading cause in developed countries is obesity. And that's a, a very large and prominent issue that I'll speak about a little later on. But the most common cause of secondary lymphedema in developing countries and underdeveloped countries is filariasis or a parasitic infection. And uh, I've seen quite a bit of that uh, in, in immigrants that come to this country uh, from an um, underdeveloped uh, environment. And um, it can be easily detected. It's uh, usually unilateral. Um, and uh, um, the treatment is very effective if you catch it early. In developed countries, the most common cause of secondary lymphedema is malignancy, uh, as you can probably imagine, from either cancer, surgery, or radiation. Trauma can cause it. Untreated chronic venous insufficiency in patients with venous disease can cause it, and uh, infection can also cause it. It can develop immediately, uh, 
or postoperatively or even months or even 10 or 20 years later. I've seen it 20 years later um, after a surgical procedure. The medical history is the diagnosis of choice. Uh, if that can be done. And uh, obviously, uh, if early on, it's a little bit more difficult. But if you can do it through the history, the signs and symptoms will tell you if you have lymphedema. If the cause is an obvious, uh, the doctor can order imaging studies. And there, there are four that are used routinely, an MRI, um, a CT scan, an ultrasound that can detect obstruction, and lymphocentigraphy, as you see in the figure to the right. The diagnostic features are, are, are shown on this picture. And this is a, uh, you know, it's amazing how, you know, I don't know the names of people, but if I see a wound or an lymphedema, lymphedema leg, I can tell you who that is uh, almost always. And it's, uh, it stays in your mind and I'm sure you feel the same way. Uh, these folks get the swollen feet, which in lymphedema, by the way, you don't, uh, but these folks do get it in the lower feet. And uh, they have deep creases in the joints, and you can see here these folds. And they get this a square or shovel toe with semer sign with a little uh, hardened area above the toe. Um, papillomatosis, which is a, a warty like appearance in the skin um, that is very common uh, in patients. Somebody took my screen away here. Okay. And you can see papillomatosis or the warty like conditions in the skin when it's advanced. Um, hemosiderosis or the staining of the lower leg, as you can see also here, you'll get blisters or bullet and uh, often ulceration that don't heal. And if these patients, by the way, injure their lower leg, they also won't heal. I'm not allowed, I can't advance now for some reason. Um, Jennifer, it's not letting me advance the slide. Um, let me see. You are you're the presenter still, so maybe um, try to uh, uh, get out of it and get back into it, maybe. Or try your keyboard. We've got remote control here. No, but why don't I ask you to go ahead and send, advance it? Okay, give me one second. Won't let me do it. Okay, here it goes. It's coming now. Okay, it might Look. need it needed. On the next. Yeah, there we go. The pictures I was trying to get to to show you that you can see the papillomatosis in the slide above, and then of course there's one on the right. You see the ulceration and the wound that won't heal, and these very classic folds in the skin. Untreated lymphedema is awful, and uh, this is this is what causes the difficulty in um, all our, our work and, and how hard it can be. Then when the tissue channels begin and start to increase in size and number, there's a reduction of oxygen to the tissues. And this reduction of oxygen is causes for few poor perfusion to the skin, which interferes with any kind of injury, uh, any healing at all, uh, and creates a culture medium for bacteria and virus um, that results in infection. So very often, these lymphedema patients, when they get a wound, they will often be infected. And because they have poor lymph transport and they have a, a, a culture medium for the bacteria, it often turns into cellulitis or lymphangitis which can be life-threatening. Uh, fibrosis, the hardening of the skin tissue, is very difficult because it can be confused with stasis dermatitis or cellulitis. And, and many times it becomes painful in lymphedema when normally lymphedema is not painful. When you look at lymphedema and lipedema, there are some obvious things that I wanted to point out because a lot of people believe and, and feel that the, the treatment works the same way. It does not. Uh, and there's specific parts of the body, but they have distinct causes and symptoms and treatments are different, lipedema and lymphedema. The first thing you need to do is really define them. Uh, lipedema primarily results from abnormal fat accumulation and lymphedema, again, is obstruction of the lymph. Uh, 
uh, lipedema can lead to lymphedema, and that's important to recognize uh, because many of these patients do develop lymphedema after prolonged lipedema, uh, and then they have the same problems with the lymphedema patient. Uh, the cuff sign is the most important sign that you want to look for in lipedema, that, that, that foot that's not so swollen, and then the swollen limb, and then that cuff right at the ankle. Uh, and stemmer signs are the little puffs above the toes that you can actually feel. Uh, this slide is quite good because it gives you a good idea of lymphedema versus lipedema. Uh, lymphedema affects both men, men and women equally, and lipedema almost exclusively women. And that, by the way, is not known. Uh, family history is present. Um, obviously, it's absent in secondary lymphedema, but it's present in lymphedema uh, when it's congenital. And lipedema is almost always present. It's also almost always a family history. Uh, edema, there's non-pitting early in lymphedema and non-pitting bilateral in lipedema. Uh, the swollen feet are present in lymphedema and absent uh, in lipedema. Yeah, if a lipedema patient initially develops swollen feet, then you know they're beginning to get lymphedema. Uh, increased fatty tissue is absent in lymphedema, uh, and lipedema presents as a nodule or fatty tissue that's painful. Uh, a normal distribution of adipose is possible, but not common in lymphedema, but it's very common and present in the arms, abdomen, and legs um, in lipedema patients. Again, the pain, the tenderness is absent in lymphedema and almost always present in lipedema. And hematomas are really absent in lymphedema patients, whereas they're very common in lipedema patients. Uh, Manual lymphatic drainage, sequential pneumatic compression pumps or both should be considered to improve lipedema tissue and decrease the pain if the patients have pain. But I have to tell you that from my experience, significant improvement in limb volume for limb lipedema patients should not be expected at any time very quickly or at all. Uh, you may remove their pain, but not remove their limb volume or decrease their edema. So this is a very good thing to know because lipedema patients will not be as responsive to your therapy. Lymphedema patients don't get depressed. And I can tell you, because I, I know for a fact they don't, and I've studied it. I've actually done some quite a bit of work on it. They get demoralized. Uh, and there's a big difference. Um, when you lose confidence and hope, you're defeated. And that's how they feel. This is how they feel. And until they find someone who feel better uh, and improves them, but, but if you tell them, look, in eight weeks, you're gonna start seeing some differences or in 12 weeks and you tell them what they're gonna feel like initially and it happens, they begin to get confidence in you. Once they get confident in you, they begin to have hope again. And that's the real key to really teach these patients what they're gonna do and what they are to expect. Let's consider the eligibility for pneumatic compression. Let me tell you, first of all, medications. If you have lymphedema patients that are on specific lymphedema medications like antibiotics, diuretics, anticoagulants, uh, they've never shown any therapeutic value in any reliable study. Um, surgery, now there's lymphatic bypass and vascularized lymph node transfer, which show promise, but these are difficult surgeries and not without complication. And if your lymphedema patient has undergone debulking, um, that's a very difficult surgical procedure with lots of complications, and it does not improve lymph flow. So you're still going to have to manage their lymphedema. The treatments of choice are manual lymphatic drainage, complex decongestive therapy, and intermittent pneumatic compression, either by themselves or a combination of each. And I'll show you evidence that shows that combining them works better. CDT and IPC, uh, if I'm speaking to therapies, uh, yeah, pardon me for telling you the obvious, you already know this. Uh, complex decongestive therapy is a multimodal therapy. It consists of not only conservative management um, with manual lymphatic drainage, and it, it involves compression usually with multi-layer bandaging, sometimes with elastic stockings. 
and it has to include exercise and skin care. Uh, and phase one is to reduce the initial swelling, and phase two is maintenance. With intermittent pneumatic compression, it's a therapy that involves an inflatable sleeve, which can be done at home or in your office. Um, it can be attached to a machine, and it is attached to a machine, and the machine actually inflates these particular chambers of the pump and deflates them gradually. The intermittent pneumatic compression is, can be used as a treatment uh, adjunctly to CDT, uh, particularly in my experience in patients who have compromised mobility. They do much, much better than those that do not when you in, incorporate intermittent pneumatic compression. Uh, it really helps their mobility status. Complex decongestive therapy, as I mentioned before, is a daily therapy followed by compression bandages and exercise. Um, it's limited in effectiveness with fibrotic limbs. The more fibrosis you get, the harder it is for you to see a big change. Intermittent pneumatic compression has been used since the 50s with tons of evidence. It's multiple chambers usually, and it can work in a gradient sequential compression from like the foot to the ankle, to the calf, to the thigh, and so forth. Um, my go-to, um, and I'm gonna speak about different um, settings, but my go-to uh, is 50 to 60 milliliters of mercury, uh, and I like to perform it twice a day. Um, I like to use it with some compression stocking or a bandage, but it can be used with or without. And the results are seen from six to 12 weeks. And I can tell you by the patient's lymphedema when they will see the results. And I can tell you exactly what they'll feel when they get the results because I've talked to so many. And this is, this is the time that you really gain the confidence by telling them when they're gonna start to see a difference in how they feel. You need to evaluate these patients no matter what you do. Uh, and a lot of times they come really under-evaluated from their doctor, but it's really important as a therapist, as a doctor, for you to understand that these things are critical. Um, they really need to be evaluated. The most important one is the ankle to brachial index. You need to be sure they don't have peripheral vascular disease or any type of arterial obstruction. Uh, and that's important and a very easy test to do. An ankle brachial index is easy to do. Uh, it's a cuff at the ankle and a cuff compared to the radial normal blood pressure. And you compare the blood pressure of the radius of the arm to the leg. And you want a ratio, a ratio of one is normal. Uh, anything less than 0.8 is not. But a good brachial to ankle index will allow you to rest easy to know that you're not you don't have an arterial component to your disease. You can also do an ultrasound scan to rule out a mass. And I like this with cancer patients because you wanna be sure they have no other obstruction either in their abdominal or inguinal space. And uh, I like to teach, when I teach the doctors and residents, I teach them that they really need to order an ultrasound scan to rule out mass in abdominal and uh, inguinal space. And it's a very easy test to do, it's non-invasive. I like a mobility test to see how much they can walk, how much movement they can do, because that tells you about how much exercise you can really have them do. And you want to be sure that they're not allergic to any of the components of what you're going to use. Contraindications, again, is the ankle to brachial index. And in some patients with a, a lot of uh, fibrosis, you can't compress the blood vessels with a standard blood cuff. And in those patients, you need to do a toe cuff measurement for blood pressure. Uh, they're rare, but you, but you really need to understand that. If you, you can't compress the vessels, you can't really get an accurate ABI. Recent history of DVT is something I, I like to avoid using any type of compression on. Uh, if the DVT, if the thrombus is uh, stable and been there for a long time, then you're perfectly safe. But if it's a recent DBT, it can dislodge. Allergy to a bandage or device component, uh, active skin infection, and congestive heart failure, either a stage C or D or a New York class three, because you're moving fluid up to the lymph and that's gonna cause a little more difficulty in breathing. When this happens for me uh, and for our people, our uh, facility is we use one, one leg sleeve at a time. 
and see how they do with one leg sleeve, uh, and then uh, as they can bear with it and uh, their their breathing is not affected, then we'll go on with the two sleeve system. And remember, IPCs uh, and uh, CDT both require uh, licensed physician provider prescription. Uh, compression is really very important to know about. You say, well, I'm not talking to you about compression. Well, I want to tell you about compression is a, a big problem if you just don't know how to do it right. And it takes a lot of time to be good at compression. And the shape of the leg is critical. But, but a compression is the cornerstone of management for all these patients. Even when, when you do MLD, compression is important. Uh, it reduces venous hypertension. It improves the function of the calf muscle pump. Therefore, that means that compression of any type is more effective in an ambulating patient, patient they can walk, and to teach them to do heel-to-toe walking, because as they get their legs big, they begin to shuffle. And you know what I mean. You see these patients, they don't really walk normally, they shuffle. And if you get them to walk heel-to-toe, even if they go nice and slow, it improves that movement of their venous system, which moves lymph along as well. 20 to 30 millimeters is accurate. In some cases, this is any type of compression, but it's not known what's optimal. For example, in little legs, 20 to 30 can be super tight, whereas in big legs, 20 to 30, won't, you won't see even a difference uh, in any, anything you see. So it really varies on the person uh, and it varies on the actual person that's actually providing the compression. I call it the art of bandaging. And we used to have bandaging contests at our clinic and, uh, and we made a real fun time of it, but you can really succeed bandaging. And if you do it really good, man, the patient is gonna ask for you every single time. I guarantee you that you will get complete adherence. I'm not gonna use the word compliance because it's always all in agreement between the patient and your treatment. It's an adherence program. You will get no better adherence when you have good compression, like you see on the below on the slides above. Whereas you have lousy wrap jobs and bad legs that lead to not only uh, lymphatic lymphatic obstruction with a bad bandage uh, or a, a total deformed leg that's very difficult to treat. So I can't tell you enough how important bandaging is and how important it is to do it right. Now. Now, that, that, that being said, remember that stockings are just as hard. And uh, those of you who use them all the time, if you use the right size stockings, when they get easy to apply, they're no good anymore, right? Uh, that's exactly right. And um, the patients need help to put them on. They can't all put them on by themselves. They need either a device called a butler or a silicone sleeve and an open toe stocking. So both require your knowledge and your teaching to make them adhere to your program. Choosing the right device, the settings, and pressure therapy intervals are, is very important, and we're going to cover that now. Adherence, like I said before, is key. And you, you know, when you talk to your patient, you sit with them knee to knee first, sit with them knee to knee, and stay off your computer for a minute and, and say to them, you know, what are you feeling? What, what's your biggest problem with your with your leg what can you can you dance can you walk can you climb steps what what is your problem what is the biggest concern you have and i've had people say i can't you know i can't go on the subway because my leg sinks or you know little things like that that you can fix so quick um and that will cause them to have hope in you but you must remember that if the patient can't tolerate a bandage, you can't use one, don't. Even if you have to give up on time, uh, don't make them comply to something that's uncomfortable, uh, difficult for them. There are lots of adjustable compression devices, inelastic and elastic, and uh, there's with intermittent pneumatic compression, I've never had a complaint, not a single complaint in over the 600 cases we've ever had. Uh, about patients uh, if, if you know what you're doing and if you set the pressures correctly. The IPC device can either be a four chamber or an eight chamber. It can be gradient going from the foot all the way up to the thigh, like I mentioned before. It can be sequential, which is in that order. It can be, uh, obviously, they're pneumatic. And it can also be programmable. You can actually program um, each, each of the chambers. 
Um, the short sleeve is the one they all want to use. It's the least effective. The three quarter sleeve I'll give into. The full sleeve is the best sleeve to use. If you use a full sleeve on the patient's leg, they get better lymphatic movement and better venous movement up to the heart. I like one hour twice a day, um, but I'm not married to that either. And uh, I'll give into it, uh, provided we can agree on an adherence program that um, you, you can really be set on and you can really work with. Uh, recommended settings for me are 50 to 60, but I believe me, I give in on that too. And that's important as well. You may want to begin a little earlier, especially if there's a wound in one of the chambers um, and um, you don't have the programmable chamber. You may not want to squeeze that wound that hard. It may hurt them. So you, you may want to set the settings a little lower first. Um, but if you can, I'd begin at 50 or 60 because that works for us and, and it, it's worked throughout all our history and all our randomized trials. And I can guarantee you, Oscar Alvarez guarantee, that if you do it at 50 to 60 and the patients adhere to your program, they will improve in 6 to 12 weeks. Therapy sessions in the decubitus position, lying down is best. Um, you can have a little head elevation, but not much uh, if you can, because you want to move that blood back to the heart. And remember, uh, when you elevate the legs, you don't need to elevate above your heart, just to the level of your heart. Um, that's really the key. Some patients that have big issues with weight have a difficult time uh, really adhering to that program. So you have to make, you have to be sure you can give in a little time. A resting chair or a, um, a jerry chair or a comfort chair that elevates the legs is, uh, is effective. Uh, so is a, uh, a couch or even a bed with a little head elevation that works as well too. Um, I like the patients to keep a daily diary uh, because that tells me that they care, that they're into it, and, and it really makes me feel good that they're doing it. Uh, and I like to check the devices every four weeks or so. I have them bring it in uh, and take a quick look. It takes 10 minutes. Just be sure that everything's working appropriately. But tell, these devices don't break down. Uh, in all the studies I've ever had, I don't think I've had one problem. I had one particular patient bring back a device that had a little hole in one of the tubes because uh, a mouse or a rat in their apartment actually ate it, ate the little hole in the tube. That's the only time I've ever had a device with any uh, problem. These devices are unbelievable. I've seen them dropped and they still work. They're, they're just incredible pumps. The goal of treatment is what the patient's biggest problem is. And that's why I mentioned to you, you need to ask them. If it's pain, that's the one goal you need to address right away. If it's exudate or odor, if it's healing, that you got to address right away. Uh, if it's decrease the limb size, you begin at six weeks. If they have stage two lymphedema, uh, you'll see it in six to eight weeks, stay at 12 weeks better. Uh, increase patient function. You want to ask them how much they can walk, um, how much they can do. And as they get better, they'll do more. And I expect them all to lose weight. Uh, and I, I mentioned it every time that it's very difficult to lose weight for these folks, but they have to try. Limb size is really important. Now here's a, a, a re really good study that shows you that when you do, this is a four layer bandage compression study with intermittent pneumatic compression. When you use intermittent pneumatic compression plus a good compression bandage, like you saw in that previous slide, a real good application, you'll get to see really nice reduction in calf, uh, ankle to calf. And you can see here from week, from baseline to week 20, uh, about a 20% difference. However, if you do a good bandage, you get about a 10 to 12% difference by itself. None of this has manual lymphatic therapy or decongestive therapy. So you can think how much better that would be if that study included that. But I am going to talk to you about some studies that do include that and show you those results. What do you want to have in your office to tell you there's improvement? A tissue tonometer or, or a durometer. These are little devices. They're not expensive that you can actually put on the tissue and tell you how much fibrosis there is. Now, this is some work by Marcella Saleska, uh, who's just a great researcher. And you can see at control and after a month of intermittent pneumatic compression, 
how much softer the tissues get. And that alone is, is fabulous for you to show your patient. And I, I, I probably guarantee you, none of you have a tonometer. Um, if you do, my gosh, you must have been able to listen to my lecture or read one of our papers. Uh, this is a great device. I think you can get them for like $150 uh, US. But yeah, it's a, it's a great device. Uh, and I certainly recommend you get one to just to show and, and show your patients how much better they're getting. Here's a, a really good study um, that's uh, fairly recent, 2023. And uh, in, in this particular study, manual lymph drainage, sequential pneumatic compression pumps, or both, uh, should be considered. Uh, but in this randomized trial, patients with MLV and compression with compression stockings, not bandages, they were randomized into two groups that alternated intermittent pneumatic compression with manual lymphatic therapy. Uh, and you can actually see uh, the, the, the design of the study. So you introduced IPC into their program, into their actual program. So these patients were undergoing CDT. And in addition to that, they added IPC and wanted to see what a difference the intermittent pneumatic compression made. If you look at, the, at slide number A, A, you can see that this is the ankle. And IPC was a little bit better than either MLV or both, if you wanted ankle circumference reduction. Uh, this is quality of life is F. If you look at F, it's quality of life. And here, the lower the value, the better the results. So IPC, the quality of life changes were greater than MLV or when both were used. And then, uh, slide number C is the difference between volume, and you can see that here IPC both were a little better than IPC alone or MLV alone. At the end of the study, the patients were asked to give an overall evaluation. Almost 80% found IPC very helpful, 60% found decongestion with IPC alone helpful. However, so about 70% of the patients missed the contact with the therapist. And how can you blame them? This is so important to them. So this is why it's great that when you add it to your practice, you not only get significant benefit, but you also can still see the patient and they can see you, which is such a great part of their care. Um, this is a, another trial. Uh, and, and this is a 30 patient uh, randomized control trial where they use self-lymphatic drainage. Uh, and I don't know how many of you will actually teach your patients how to do MLD for the patient, the simplified form. Uh, and it can be easily carried out after a short training program. And in this study, what they did was this, these were uh, cancer patients with self lymphedema drainage treatment. And they were all taught group one was MLD. Group two was IPC with self lymphatic um, drainage. And as you can see here, uh, IPC therapy was found was for 45 minutes at 25 millimeters of mercury. Now, remember I showed you my, my results were 50 to 60. Uh, these arm are, uh, should be a lot less. If you can start a little higher, 30 to 35, that's best. But 25, this study was 25 and it was either once a day or twice a day, they let the patient decide on what they wanted to do. And the patients performed the self-lymphatic drainage every day um, for 15 minutes at home during the trial. And in the conclusion, the complex decongestive therapy or IPC and self-lymphatic drainage were similarly effective in the treatment of lymphedema and patients with breast cancer. So the nice part about it is that these patients, if they need to be at home, IPC can be done at home very simplistically with them. And it's something that you need to think about and consider and what may be best for them. Um, these are two different studies that show very effective results of intermittent pneumatic compression. And uh, this is a adjunctive therapy of intermittent pneumatic compression combined with decongestive um, lymphatic therapy or CDT. And as you can see in the left side, um, there was a, a quite a quite a big reduction in lymph volume and edema reduction and volume on the other study as well. Uh, 
as you can see in 60 days, you saw a pretty significant difference. Uh, and this again was post-cancer uh, surgery and basically only the arms. You can use near-infrared images of lymphatic flow to show you to prove that you're moving lymph along. And if you've ever done this, this is a very gratifying type of uh, uh, diagnostic uh, tests that you can really do to show that you're actually opening up lymph channels as your therapy is working. So you actually are moving lymph up the leg. And um, this, you can see, this is the dye injection, and there's no, uh, this is pneumatic compression therapy, PCT. This is before PCT, after PCT, you can see not only that, but you can see clear channels being developed after pneumatic therapy. Um, this is the work of Olszewski and Saleska uh, that I showed you before. And this is at, uh, with a vital pump, actually vital compression A chamber, intermittent pneumatic compression pump. You can see a baseline. This is lymphocentigraphy at six months. Look how much more lymph. And then at eight months, you can see lymph channels going right up to the thigh uh, of the leg. So if you look at tissue fluid volume flow during pneumatic compression, and this is at 50, 80, and 120 millimeters of mercury in patients with and without lymphedema, you can see that in lymphedema patients, they really do better with a higher compression, especially if they have, if they have a lot of fibrosis. Uh, I don't go to 50 to 60 works really good for me, and I'm very happy with it. But you can see that the studies have shown that increased compression works a little better. Uh, and you can see it in healthy patients. When you look at the thigh, not so much. So remember, you don't expect changes in the thigh to happen greatly uh, fast unless there's a lot more exercise, physical exercise, and there's weight loss. But count on the calf to be your guidance because the thigh sometimes you don't see that change that quickly. Um, this is a study that um, Eric Lulov and I did. This is um, a quality of life study looking at uh, palliative care. So we used to, these patients were at end of life and there's the symptom they had either pain, edema, or inflammation wasn't healing. Uh, they didn't really care about healing, but if you could reduce their pain, boy, they, they, they were very happy. And this is a baseline and in 12 weeks of treatment with IPC devices, a four chamber device at 50 millimeters of mercury once or twice a day. Look at 12 weeks, huge difference in pain, huge difference in edema, and a huge difference in inflammation. Uh, and this is from the patient's quality of life, uh, what's called a, a short form 12, which is a, a very clinically validated device that, that patients use to determine their quality of life. This is work by Desai and others. This is with a, with a quality of life survey in SF36. And uh, this is at three months and one year after IPC therapy. Uh, and you can see not only are their physical functioning better, their physical health better, their emotional health doesn't change much, their energy fatigue, emotional well being, pain, general health. And the average was by far greater um, after a year than when you first began. Recommendations. So here's what you, you got to really be with the patient and work with the patient in an adherence program. Uh, research studies are all varying. They vary between 25 and 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, that's a big difference. Um, pre pressure setting should be set on the balance between the patient's comfort and the degree of fibrosis. And with your tonometer, you can really tell how much fibrosis there is. Uh, and even with your hands, if, if you're experienced at it, if you have you know, really good feeling for it. Uh, but if you, if you don't, you start at 50 and you go from there, either go, go down a little bit or up a little bit. Pressures and intervals vary between initial therapy and maintenance. Once the patient is at the maintenance stage, you can lower the pressure or you can even go to once a day. Um, and have, have them do a, a lot less therapy and, and maintenance and during their maintenance phases. At initial therapy, I like to be aggressive because I like to get them to the point where, where they lose that demoralization, where they feel good about themselves again. And then once they're there, then you can give in a little bit more. 
Congestive, um, complex decongestive therapy and IPC should always include appropriate exercise. And I can't say that enough because patients, if you don't tell them about it, they don't expect you to tell them. Uh, but I tell them to walk. And, I, you know, and they say, well, gee, I can't walk very much. It's too hot, whatever. I tell them, go to the grocery store. Inside the grocery store, grab a cart you can lean on and go nice and slow up and down every aisle. It's air conditioned. The floors are clean. At the end of your 15-minute uh, walk, grab a, a small carton of milk and, and get out. And you can do it twice a day, once a day, whatever one you want, you can do it. Walk. The more you walk, the better you get, but help them find a place they can walk. There's lots of really good places. Malls are nice. Anything that's air conditioned is nice. Anything that has a smooth surface is nice. I like to use an implemented validated quality of life tool before and during and after therapy. I, I like either a 12 question form or a very short form and I can help you get these forms, but you should start these patients right away so they see how they're getting better. Um, and if they see at the beginning and then they see it eight and 12 weeks, how much better they've gotten, um, you'll see how much more confident they've come with your sessions. Compression with stockings or properly applied bandaging should continue between therapy. I can't also I, I just stress this enough to all the doctors and nurses that ever go through our program. You don't give up on compression. You still have to apply it even when they're better. These are the IPC devices available in Canada. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to let you take over these slides here, the next few slides. Great. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Uh, so three pumps are available in Canada. These are all licensed by Health Canada as well um, with all of the provincial uh, government health programs and the um, any private health um, insurance companies too as well. Um, so we've got three different devices. I'll take you high level through the differences. Um, the first one would be a four chamber pump. Um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave it to Dr. Alvarez to talk about the differences between the four and the eight in a second, but let me just quickly review these. We've also got the um, eight chamber, and then we've got a 4,008 chamber. And the difference here with this one is that it's programmable. So you can adjust the pressure in each of the chambers. And this may be necessary if the patient has any wounds or any sensitive areas where certain parts of the limb um, might need a lower pressure. Uh, so this um, 4,008 eight chamber pump um, will allow you to, to do that. Um, this also includes a pre-therapy mode um, for a therapist and for patients who um, are interested in that um, program. Uh, Dr. Evers, we get a lot of questions about the efficacy and the differences between a four versus an eight chamber pump. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that from your experience? Yeah, first of all, if you do the literature search, you're going to find that there isn't much of a difference between uh, in research studies between the four chamber and the eight chamber. Uh, there is a fairly big difference in the sleeve. It's the longer sleeve uh, versus shorter sleeve. Uh, but I like, I like common sense. For example, I like an eight chamber on a tall person. Um, I think it works better. Uh, I think it, uh, it's much more effective. And although there is no evidence, it's sort of common sense that the larger the leg, um, the more the chambers. Uh, and if you have to go with a low pressure, I also go with greater chambers. So if you have to go with lower pressure, I'd rather do it with an eight chamber gradient than in a four chamber gradient. Um, but if you can go 50 to 60, four chamber is a go-to wonderful pump that works almost every single time. The eight chamber programmable is really great if you have an area where rheumatoid arthritis or, or, or a wound um, where you can actually can, can change the pressure in that one programmable chamber, that one area that squeezes could be squeezing less than the other. Um, and that, uh, that, that particular uh, pump, the programmable pump is really considered very advanced therapy. Uh, but very useful uh, when there's, like I mentioned before, rheumatoid arthritis or arthritic situation or a, um, a wound that's present that's painful. The other difference just to add is in terms of garments. If um, your patient requires a um, pant 
or a jacket. Um, you can see a picture of the pant or the um, a jacket or a vest in the uh, in the slide there. Then they would require a an eight chamber pump. So either the 2008 or the 4008 would work well for either of those garments. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, um, other than sort of the specific little nuances that Dr. Ever has mentioned, um, a four chamber pump is uh, very effective um, under those situations. Um, the other difference would be cost. A four chamber pump is um, more cost effective than an eight chamber. Um, so in terms of pricing, the four chamber uh, 2004 pump would be the lowest price than the 2008, and then the 4008 would be the most expensive given the additional functionalities that we discussed. Um, on to garments. Um, so BioCompression has the most extensive range of garments available on the market. They have 55 um, different over-the-counter sizes of garments, everything from legs to arms to pants to jackets and vests. Um, we even do um, custom sizing. So as you can see, for situations in you know morbid obesity situations or even pediatric, we, we do get um, children from time to time, um, they will do custom um, sizes where they will take the measurements and literally hand cut and draw and, and make a garment to the patient's specifications. Um, another hot topic, um, hot topic, excuse me, and I know, Anne, you had a question. Um, I'm gonna review uh, the funding eligibility and coverage for IPC in Canada. Uh, so it varies, um, uh, and I was just explaining this to Dr. Alvarez a little bit earlier. So the funding varies um, and the coverage options um, exist in Canada, but it varies from province to province, and it varies based on um, the individual's private insurance coverage. Um, so with respect to provincial health care, um, there is coverage in certain provinces, um, specifically um, through the SAIL program in Saskatchewan and ADP in Ontario. So ADP only provides coverage for primary lymphedema um, diagnoses. Um, SAIL is more open to both primary and secondary. So please consult your um, province's health ministry website for specific information. Um, if you have uh, questions, um, if you're looking to find uh, an ADP dealer or an ADP authorizer, um, please let us know, reach out to the team um, at Paradigm, and we'll be able to help you kind of um, find a local one um, in your area. Uh, with respect to private insurance, uh, there's a lot of uh, private insurances uh, plans that out there um, that provide coverage for the pneumatic compression pump, often for conditions um, such as lymphedema. Um, it varies dramatically um, in terms of the amount that's coverage and the criteria. So you need to contact your um, benefit provider um, and ask them uh, what type of coverage your plan um, or your patient's plan uh, provides um, to get the specifics. This is also a, uh, the um, intermittent pneumatic compression devices are all um, approved by Health Canada and licensed by Health Canada. Um, they are deemed a class two medical device, which requires a prescription in order to, um, to acquire. Um, as such, um, these eligible medical um, expenses can be deducted on your income tax return to help you reduce um, the amount of income tax that you have to pay. So that's something that's very important. So anything, um, any amounts that you have to pay out of pocket, you can um, use an, as an el eligible medical spend, expense, excuse me, um, to deduct your income tax um, amounts. In addition, um, these are also deemed zero rated medical supplies, which means that there are, are no sales tax um, applicable on these products when they're purchased with a prescription. So that means no GST or HST, um, the tax rate is zero. Um, lastly, um, there is community support uh, for these products. Um, you'd want to contact your local um, any local um, uh, organizations and community organizations. Um, some examples are the Canadian Red Cross, Easter Steel, March of Dimes Canada, 
um, the Rotary Club. Um, these are all um, organizations um, on a case-by-case -case scenario um, would consider providing funding for, um, for, for these products. Um, so please do, um, the recommendation would be to review your benefits plan um, to ensure that um, your specific coverage um, uh, you understand them, and um, and then um, you can um, uh, provide them to your patients um, accordingly. And was I was I able to answer your question there? Okay, you know what, Anne has just um, uh, popped off, um, but she had a question about um, ADP funding for secondary lymphedema in Ontario. And at this time, it is not available to secondary lymphedema patients. It's only available to uh, primary cases. Um, we also had a question about who's authorized to put, um, to write the prescription. Um, there is a list um, on um, ADP's website and as well um, with your insurance provider. Every ins private insurance provider has a different criteria in terms of who can provide the prescription. So once again, you want to contact the insurance provider to find out who they um, who um, is able to authorize uh, the prescription. And as well, ADP has a list specifically, uh, which we can include when we send around the, uh, the email. If you just email us, we can provide you with that. Um, and um, so if the patient is paying out of pocket, um, who can provide the prescription? So it, um, there is a list, I'll provide it to you. It's on Health Canada's website. If you can just shoot us an email at info at paradigmmedical.com, we'll be able to get that information to you. It's a big list, so we'll, uh, we'll provide that to you so it's clear. <laughs> All right, with that, Dr. Evers, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so we'll just, just go over some contraindications just so that um, you, you guys are familiar with it. Um, known or suspected recent, again, recent is the key. Any type of recent DVT, you want to not use the pump or any type of compression. Um, class, or four, class three or four, congestive heart failure, abdominal or pelvic mass, stiff cancer, pulmonary embolism, thrombophlebitis, acute inflammation of the skin, like an infection, uh, uncontrolled cardiac failure, pulmonary edema, and uh, any kind of arterial disease. These are frequently asked questions, but I, let's uh, let you guys um, go ahead and see if there are any questions for me. And um, these are questions that I get all the time. Uh, um, that pop up and you can look at it, maybe it'll trigger your question by itself. But please uh, be happy to address the questions. Jennifer, if you can just um, let me know what they are. So, uh, okay, so thank you, Dr. Alvarez. I'll, I just have a quick one here, I just wanna clarify. So we had a question, if um, a patient is paying out of pocket, uh, do they still need a prescription? And the answer is yes. Um, if you're looking for a list of um, doctors or um, health practitioners who can provide um, the prescription, there is a list on Health Canada's website. Um, feel free to email us at info at paradigmmedical.com and we'll be able to um, provide you with that list or a link to the to Health Canada website so you can you can see that. Um, I have a few questions that I'm just going to run through with you, Dr. Alvarez. Um, so we have a question from Eric. What is the contradiction standard with TBI for compression bandages and IPC? With um, T, what about the, I didn't get the, the, the uh, what, repeat the question, what TDI, what is that? TBI. Eric, if you can clarify what you are referring to when you say TBI. ABI, oh, tro trobrachial index. No, what you want to do here, as a matter of fact, there's another question about arterial disease. 
you want to be sure that the patient does not have uh, severe arterial disease. If the patient has uh, mixed disease, both uh, arterial and, and venous, and the ABI or the ankle brachial index or the, or the toe um, index is 50%, that's, that's fine, uh, provided they're not symptomatic. But the patient has um, claudication. Uh, this is like walking. When you squeeze their leg, it's like walking. Uh, they're going to get pain. Um, and you have to really be aware of it. And you can still do it. You just may not need to do it in a very low uh, setting. Uh, but I like to, to take these patients independently and really see how much uh, arterial disease they have. And with a good, good ABI, you can really monitor it and then uh, move accordingly. But if you don't start at a high pressure setting, and if they have a, a intermittent quadrication, I like to be sure I'm in constant contact with them about pain because this is a lot like walking. When you squeeze their legs, it's like taking steps and they'll get pain in their legs. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but this is why I like to watch it. Um, it I don't want to say it's a, um, it should be avoided completely. No, it's, it's something that you need to be aware of and, and with your patient and work with your patient. But you could have a level of arterial disease that's very manageable, very clearly manageable. But um, if I give this talk and I don't mention it, uh, then uh, shame on me because I think you can get into real trouble if you have a patient with established severe claudication and you begin to squeeze their leg in an uncontrolled fashion. Um, so we had another question. Um, uh, why is active cancer a contraindication? Um, I thought that was an old theory that was debunked. No, not at all. Not in my book. Uh, if you have active cancer, you've got a mass. You've got, you've got a mass right now, and, and you have a mass, and, you, and that mass hasn't been diagnosed. That's why I like to do the, the CT scan to rule out mass in the inguinal or abdominal area. If you have a mass, it's going to block the lymph, and it's going to be affecting either the genitals or any other part of, of your body that can be uh, that can be also full of lymph. Um, I like if, if there's a cancer, I want a negative scan. I want a negative uh, abdominal and inguinal scan. What about under palliative care situations? I love Where they're it. looking for more quality of life as opposed to yeah, pain, pain. For pain relief, uh, absolutely. Pain relief uh, is huge. And then movement, being able for the patients to move a little bit, to get up and around. Uh, this is like a massage. In lots of ways, it's a very similar to a, a, a really good massage. And remember what you're doing is you're moving not only the lymph, you're also moving venous blood up to the heart. So you have less venous congestion. You have a, a much lighter leg instead of a heavier leg. Uh, and you are able to walk and move better. Uh, and uh, for pain, it's it's fabulous for pain. I, mean, I didn't show you all our pain studies, but in every every study we've ever done, pain is almost one of the key ingredients where pain is gone immediately. And you saw that quality of life study that Eric and I published uh, uh, showed you that pain went from from seven to a zero uh, after twelve weeks of therapy. And these are all palliative care patients. But by, by, by palliative care, uh, you, it, that's when symptom management trumps healing or trumps cure. Uh, not, not necessarily under death. You can be in palliative care for, for years. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that death. It means that, that now your symptom and your management of your symptom trumps or is above. The priority is greater than cure. And this is something that's very important in the management of all these people. It's much better. Uh, just, just a further question to add on to that from PJ. As far as the cancer question, the fear is not spreading cancer then. It's worry about a possible blockage. Yes, worry about blockage. Great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask another um, common question that we get um, while everyone is sort of thinking uh, about theirs. Um, what is the difference between focus uh, therapy uh, versus pre-therapy, and and how are you using that? Um, 
What is the difference between focus? Uh, there, so there's two modes um, on the biocompression um, yeah. uh, devices. There's a, a focus therapy and there's yes. also okay. a pre-therapy. How are you using that? When, when are you using them and sort of what situation? How do you find them if you use them at all? Uh, mm -hmm. What's your feedback? I don't, I don't really use those uh, feature. I, I, right away, depending on the patients and their symptoms, um, I start them at 50 to 60 um, twice a day. And, um, you know, I'm in, in touch with them all the time and they, they communicate with us remotely, constantly, um, and can tell us how they're feeling, how, how it's working for them. Um, if, if they are, they can tolerate it and if not a factor, I like to keep it there for oh, six weeks, at least doing the tonometer and the measurements and, and see the difference and see how it works. But I, you know, I, I trust what works for us. Um, that's why, you know, experience is so important and, you know, I hope I can share that with you. That what's important is that, that yeah, I can tell you that if you use it the way we use it, you're going to get this results we are showing. Wonderful. Um, another question that's common is um, for a clinical setting, what kind of garment um, garments do you recommend so that um, you can ensure that you kind of addressing the majority of, of uh, patients that you're seeing uh, in terms of sizing and the, um, um, the, uh, uh, the types of garments? Yeah, for, for, first of all, a garment that, that the patient can apply. <laughs> and, I, and I test them right away. I, you know, with the garment, I, I, let me see you put on the garment and then see how you do. Uh, you, you have to remember that it, it, these garments are not easy to apply. Um, have you ever tried to apply a compression stocking? I've worn them, so I, I can tell you I wear everything I provide a patient with it be just because I want to know how it feels. And I can tell them that, you know, this is how it feels and this is how hard it is. So I want to provide them with a, a garment they can fit into and a garment they can tolerate. Um, adjustable garments are a little bit more favorable for me because uh, they can be adjusted as they get a little bit better. Um, so, but again, adjustable garments need to have some dexterity of the hands and some ability to understand how to apply them. Um, but you, you should always in service them on applying that and, and applying the sleeve and how to put on the sleeve properly, that as well. Uh, and it takes, you know, a few 15 minutes at the very most to teach them and, uh, uh, and, and get the right therapy device for them and, and the right type of device uh, for their use when they're not in therapy. And do you have any tips on um, how to help them um, apply the garments um, so that... Well, it depends on the garment. Um, if it's a socking, um, first of all, I, I like for them to get an open toe socking um, because with an open toe socking, socking they can apply it with a, a siliconized sleeve, which are inexpensive. You put the siliconized sleeve on your leg um, and then you just the stocking glides right over that siliconized sleeve. And then you just pull the siliconized sleeve from the, from the open toe portion of the socking and you pull it from right underneath the socking. That, that usually is the very, very best way to apply a socking by far. Um, patients that don't do that well with it, um, there's a butler, a little device that looks like a, a bent clothes hanger. Um, I wish I had a picture here to show you, uh, but that's also a very good device you can apply while sitting down. Um, and, you know, it depends on the device. If it's an arm sleeve, again, uh, you, you want to have a, a siliconized sleeve. You can apply first so that you can apply the, the actual sleeve. If it's not adjustable, apply it through the arm um, and then pull the sleeve out from the bottom of the arm um, so that you get that, that, that sleeve applied, but you get the siliconized garment that's easy to put on. Makes it very, very simple to do. Um, and I can provide you all the information about these devices. They're very inexpensive and very accessible, and they last a long time. Thank you. Um, any tips for um, uh, when you're measuring um, patients for for the uh, for the garments? For any difficult to measure, or if patients their weight and size is fluctuating, um, or they have disproportional um, 
limb areas? Yeah, I like to I like to follow the, the guide, guidelines that are provided by the manufacturer um, and follow them to the T. Follow them exactly, um, and you want to do it initially, and and then perhaps as they improve, you may need to do it again um, to get a device that's uh, a little bit more, a little better fitting. Uh, and this is why the adjustable devices, if you, if you if they're applicable, do better because you can just readjust them without having to actually get another device. But I, I like to follow the recommendations of the actual manufacturer of the device and just follow them to the T and provide them um, just like they ask. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just seeing, checking the questions. So if anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll wait a few more minutes and then um, we will end the presentation. Um, so if there's anything, no question is a bad question as Dr. Revar has mentioned. Um, we want to make sure we address everything here um, as much as possible. Um, Dr. Alvarez, if you can um, move forward on the slides. Um, one more, please. Yeah, so here's all of Paradigm Medical's contact information. If you're interested in finding or becoming an IPC dealer, uh, please reach out to us. We also offer a IPC dealer training program uh, for those who of you who are interested in becoming a dealer, um, or if you're just interested in getting a catalog and some information, uh, please reach out to us. Um, uh, Mina at info at paradigmmedical.com. You probably got the email from her uh, regarding the dial-in information. You can reach out to her um, or Svetlana, um, and they'll be able to address any of your questions, um, whether it be um, funding specific questions, looking for an ADP dealer or a provincial related question on funding, um, whether it be garment um, or uh, pump specific questions, please don't hesitate to um, direct your questions to us. Uh, we'll be happy to answer them uh, and point you in the right direction. Um, if there's no other questions, I want to thank you once again, Dr. Alvarez, um, for your time here. This has probably been our um, uh, in terms of the signups, uh, we got uh, one of the largest uh, number of registrants uh, for this uh, presentation. So I know the interest um, was huge and I think you delivered because uh, I think we got a lot of very good questions um, and a lot of um, people asking for the recording. Um, we have recorded this presentation. We will distribute it to um, those of you who've registered. So um, don't worry, um, you can always review the presentation after uh, this uh, live webinar ends um, as a reference or if you're interested in sending it to any of your colleagues uh, or anyone you think uh, would benefit from it, please don't hesitate to do so. You're welcome, it's my pleasure. Uh, so if there are no other questions, I will end this. Um, thank you again, Dr. Alvarez. Um, we're so appreciative of you, of you taking the time um, uh, to help educate us here in Canada. Happy, happy to do it, Jennifer. It's great, um, great to have you guys present with me, and I thank you uh, and your team. Bye, bye, everyone.